Smith. I teach in the sociology department. And this is bringing scholars of social movement coalitions together with activists who are also thinkers, theorizers, and scholars of social movements um, to reflect on what we've learned from our history, uh, what, what models we've developed over time, uh, to work together better across the many differences that human beings have in the world, uh, and to think about our political situation now and what we're up against and what we need to do um, to bring all these different forces that are in motion trying to bring about some kind of change. Um, and so our speakers are going to try to identify what they've seen from their perspectives in this movement, organizing in different spaces uh, that can help us understand better what's going on in the world and what, um, how we might think about coalition work. My name is Cindy Weissner and I am um, the national coordinator for Grassroots Global Justice Alliance. Um, the Grassroots Global Justice Alliance is a U.S.-based grassroots um, um, organization that is trying to actually build an agenda for power, for working um, um, people and poor people. And we understand the important connections between the local issues we work on um, in a global context. And we see ourselves as part of an international movement for global justice. Um, we were actually born out of the, US, uh, the World Social Forum um, process. And so it actually started as a delegation um, taking frontline leaders, indigenous peoples, Chicano youth, um, African American elder, tenant organizers, um, you know, white working class folks from Appalachia to the, the social forum process. Um, and so part of what we really believed was that movement convergence um, was really important and we saw and we saw the importance of that. Um, and I think, um, but I think I want to step back a little bit and share just a little bit, you know, part of the, the question that we, we were asked to answer was how does the economic and ecological crisis affect, um, you know, affect the, how does it affect the need for social change? And so I think, you know, like Jackie said, and like many of us know, that, you know, global politics has become very polarized. And, you know, the right wing has definitely been on, on, a, on an offensive and actually winning a lot of significant um, political victories. We've seen what has happened in Europe, and we're seeing obviously what's happened here. And in a lot of ways, the agenda is very clear about cutting public spending, persecuting immigrants, and privatizing services, which is really, you know, we see in terms of austerity, xenophobia, and privatization. And so we've seen also that the European Union is on the brink of a crisis that started in Greece but has rippled through the Eurozone, and we've also seen its impact on the global financial system and, uh, and then its impact here with, with the, the economic crisis in, in that sort of again restarted in 2008. And several, you know, left governments throughout Latin America, I think, have really uh, developed important innovations in terms of democracy, immigration, and economic policy, often uh, providing an alternative to capitalism. But we've seen the contradictions and the tensions that have existed even in the experiments that, have, uh, that are happening in Bolivia and in Venezuela in particular. Um, and also the Arab you know, uprisings that I think in this last year have really um, defined uh, a new moment in global politics and the popular mobilizations that um, in several countries that now have overthrown authoritarian uh, regimes <coughs> and heading into their second phases of struggles, um, right? Where it's either up against more concretely military rule like in it, uh, like it was in Egypt, and then now in democratic processes of around elections and writing constitutions, but I think part of it is not, um, this path is not totally clear how is it that we're going to consolidate, um, you know, democratic power. But I think it's very clear that these movements in, um, in uh, the Mashaq Maghreb region in particular and in parts of Europe have really mo uh, inspired us to mobilize worldwide against this uh, agenda of austerities, austerity, xenophobia, and privatization. Um, you know, from the indignados to the Occupy movement here in the United States. And I think a lot of, a lot of things have also, you know, here, the, the most visible, obviously, has been the 99% uh, movement, um, you know, through the occupations all across the country um, that happened. But even though these, you know, this 99%, it's most visible, what I would say, agents of change were mostly, you know, white, uh, um, anti-authoritarian, folks, um, and in a lot of ways was a very important in, um, intervention into the movement, but I think it, it, it you know, there, there was a, a historical nature around it because there was also groups and organizations and movements in this country that have also been building 
Occupy moment, um, I think a lot of people were pushed to, to move to their left. Um, you know, and I think it was very important to see different center-left um, uh, organizations uh, like the Sierra Club, the NAACP, the union, big unions like SCIU, Rebuild the Dream, begin to articulate a broader politic and um, than what they were not normally used to, begin to talk about sort of the, the system, right? They're not necessarily going to be anti-capitalist in their demands, but they begin to question the, the, the fundamentals of it on, on one level. And there's also been a development of a lot of um, you know, alliances um, and new formations of what I would say the grassroots organizing sector. And some of the work that we've been involved has been around creating um, not only building up our own alliances, um, but also building what we're calling unity, which is an alliance of alliance, that is trying to build some important in initiatives. And the members of the of unity are uh, Jobs with Justice, the National Domestic um, Workers Alliance, the National Domestic, uh, the National Day Laborers Organizing Network, uh, Right to the City, um, and Pushback and Grassroots Global um, Justice Alliance. And in a lot of ways, this is trying to advance a, a very important politic that one is grounded uh, in the work, but also begins to articulate when the crisis happened, none of our organizations or none of our alliances were able to actually have a response. You know, and so part of what we then realized that we, it was that we needed to figure out how to begin to have a much more articulated um, agen political agenda. Um, that had the frame and the groundedness and began to sort of articulate that what we needed weren't the temporary band-aid solutions, that we, what we needed was much more fundamental transformation of the economy and that what we needed was also to say that this, this crisis that was happening wasn't new to a lot of the, the groups that, and the people that we had been working with. Um, at this moment, um, you know, I think part of what we are, are, are organizing, our organizations are trying to really do is really share our best kind of methodologies and our best practices and really begin to add value to one another and increase, one, our interracial understanding and unity and in, engage in long-range collaborative efforts. And there have been many examples of this, um, in particular um, with um, Jobs with Justice and the National Domestic Workers Alliance launching um, the Caring Across Generations campaign last year that really begins to, again, put front and center um, the role of uh, what excluded workers that have historically been not covered by labor law in this country and have often been invisibilized by, um, by a lot of the traditional unions and in our economy and the service economy that we live in. And so part of it is be beginning to put out uh, a new perspective for workers that work um, in the home, that give care, <coughs> that basically uh, begins to create one higher standards for the care sector, um, but also begins to talk about ways that um, we value that work in a very different way. So it's a, a trying to deal with, again, from a feminist perspective, from a, a, an excluded worker perspective, what is it that we are trying to shape in terms of our, our frames and our demands? Um, also, the Right to the City Alliance has also launched a new initiative about really thinking about cities in a very new way. So what are 21st century cities looking like? So that one is building up, um, not, not uh, historically we've been, you know, a lot of the communities that we work with, the black, Latino, immigrant, um, you know, Asian communities have been pushed out systematically out of cities, both in services and also in places to live. And so part of what we're trying to say is what would cities that actually have at their core um, fight against gentrification efforts are not ruled by the corporate agenda and that ultimately are places where communities can grow and build and that also can think about ourselves in, in a sustainable way. And so that's a, an initiative that's been happening as well. And then um, for us as Grassroots Global Justice Alliance, we have uh, been trying to talk about how do we make the connections both on the local level, on all the issues that we're working on, on a national level, but also on an international level. And so at our membership assembly last year, we actually launched a new effort called No War, No Warming, Build an Economy for the People and the Planet. And so one begins to not uh, 
segment the issues and bring the, but actually begins to intentionally bring them together. Um, because I think for us, um, it's not a choice at this moment with both the ecological crisis and the economic crisis and the way, in a lot of ways, movements oftentimes have to figure out how to pick issues or how communities are pitted against each other. Um, we are trying to actually promote uh, a politic that basically understands the bigger connections and then also begins to say that it's not only about uh, fighting for a better uh, situation, economic, a political situation in this country, but it's also about understanding our, our historical role and relationship to the rest of the world. And the last thing that, that I think that we have to, um, that our organizations have to continue building on our intergenerational model. And I think that that's really key because in a lot of ways, so much of what happens is that there are disconnects generationally between movements and there's oftentimes a lot of recreation of the wheel. Um, and I remember when I was coming up, it's like, you know, there was two generations that I didn't, you know, I was a historical, and it's like starting all over. And I think this moment, at, at this time, it's very clear that our practice has shown that we have to build a movement that, that incorporates all the, the best of the energy and the ideas and the strategy of the youth movements, but also the, all the work and the experience and the lessons learned. So all of this to say is that I think the social forum, and I'll come back to it in round two, but the social forum has really played a key role, both, I think, one, in being able to, on the global level, to expose us to a broader politic and to expose us to movements at a different scale and folks that are actually now in processes after 10 years of the social forum are in some countries and some places of the world contesting for, for power, right? And so I think that's an important um, place to be able to interact and have conversations with people around that. And then on the U.S. level, I think it gave us an opportunity to do <coughs> movement building in a very different way. I'll let other compañeras and compañeros speak of that, but I think the U.S. social forum in a lot of ways became a place where a lot of the alliances and a lot of the work actually were born there. And so I think that, 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 that one of the greatest contributions that I think the social forum worldwide has done is the creation of relationships and networks so that then people, so that strategic initiatives can actually be built and born out of those places. And so um, I'll leave it at that.
And I mention that just to say that you don't, you can't get that mixture without first actually deciding that one of your goals is to get that mixture. And so I want to start there with talking a little bit about the history, two, two things really about the history. Um, the U.S. Social Forum process was actually the last major country in the world to have a social forum. And the international community had been really struggling with us to try to figure out when the U.S. would come around and have a social forum. You know, and, and so finally, I think in 2004, three, four, um, we were straightforwardly asked, when are y'all going to have a social forum in the United States? And so our answer was, wait a minute. We're going to have a social forum, but we have to have, take the time necessary to get the right representation at the organizing and planning and leadership table before we call for this uh, activity to take place. And what we meant by that was that we needed people of color in the leadership. We needed low-income, working-class communities in the leadership. We needed indigenous people in the leadership. We needed women and youth in the leadership. And we did good, on, better on some than we did on others, but that was, our, that was the vision that we had of what had to be at the table in order for us to um, call a social forum in the U.S. and make it representative of the communities that were the most oppressed and exploited communities throughout the country, as well as the communities that had to be in the leadership if we were going to use the social forum process to actually build another wave of social movements in this country. And, you know, a, a lot of us had the understanding that our process had to be different than the world process that it went on so far. One, because the U.S. was so far behind in movement building process today, you know, that we, we couldn't, we didn't have the luxury of saying that we could have a process that did not make decisions, did not, you know, um, participate in, in the, the development of a movement in our country because we were so far behind. So therefore, we looked at the social forum process as a process for aiding in the development of a social movement in this country. And we understood that if that social movement had any notion of being successful, it had to have the leadership of the elements that we held back from having the process go forward until we could deliver that. And so what that turned out, that turned out to be a really, really important decision. And it was important in many ways. It was important because the result of the, of the U.S. Social Forum was reflective of that decision. But it was also important because it meant that a lot of the traditional um, agencies and foundations and, and the big um, community organizations or civil rights organizations took a, took a long, hard look at this process before they would step their feet into it. You know, it was not a process that was, you know, that people could look at and say, oh yeah, we could go in there and we could take, take it over and emerge as the leadership of it. You know, they knew they had to deal with the people who were at the table from the so it was very important on both sides, one side of it being successful, the other side of it making people really uh, look at and think about this process and what would happen if they joined it. Consequently, uh, the first U.S. social forum was, I mean, you know, building a, a social movement and trying to develop a tool to help build that social movement is a very difficult task. But when you set the process up so it's not, you know, it's not part of the recent history of processes, then it makes it even 
more difficult. So, I mean, we spent two years really struggling to try to raise the resources necessary and try to set it up so that we would have, so that we could be assured that we would have a successful process. And what that meant was that we had to do it with our own money. You know, the foundations or the traditional places where you'd get the, re the resources from would not touch us initially. And initially, all the way up to the, well, I'd say about six months before it was the first social forum was going to happen. And they were waiting to see if, if this grouping of people could actually pull this off. You know, could, am I going to throw my money away by giving it to y'all? Y'all don't have any history of doing anything that we know of. And that's because they don't know history. But that was their position. Um, and so what happened was, which I think was really important for the process, is that we had to dig real deep and really decide whether or not we, this process was important enough for us to make the sacrifices of each of our organizations to actually make it happen. <laughs> so, oh boy. So money became a really important and critical aspect, but it proved to us that we could do it on our own. And that was really, really important. The content of the leadership is my, our first lesson, that that's something that we really concentrated on and should, should happen. The whole effect that it had on money and resources and the big NGOs or community-based organizations. And the, and the third thing that I think, in this limited amount of time, is this question of, okay, where are we going to have the first U.S. social forum? Which was a really, really big struggle. Because, I mean, I, I live in Atlanta. So, <laughs> that's not the reason it went there, but I live in Atlanta, so I was happy that it was decided that Atlanta would be the first site of the social forum. But we really put some thought into why, where it should be. And we had a little bit of a struggle, you know, particularly with the Bay Area. The Bay Area really thought that they should have the first one. And, you know, for a long time they held this big attitude toward us for not bringing it to the Bay Area. But what we said was, that if this is being developed as a tool to help us develop this current social motion wave, then it should hook up with the history of social movements in this country. It should hook up with the South because the South was the last great wave of social movements in this country and therefore in order to be hooked with that history, we should have it in the South. And of course, we should have it in Atlanta because, after all, that was the center of the social movement in, in terms of its leadership. Not in terms of the battles, but in terms of its leadership, Atlanta was the center. And of course, I lived there. So <laughs> it, became, it became really critical that we have it there. And so we really fought hard, and that's why it was in Atlanta for that so first social form because we wanted to make sure that this was a historic event that was hooked into the history of this country. The last thing I'm going to say is why we went to Detroit next because um, I just think that's important. Detroit, as any of you might know, is the epicenter of the direction that this country is going. If you go to Detroit and you, and you drive around or walk around the city of Detroit, I'm originally from Detroit. <coughs> I grew up there, worked in the auto plants there, and, you know, so I had a clear understanding of what Detroit had been. And then to go back now and look at what Detroit is today, you have got to wonder what in the world is going on with our economic structure, with our historic view of what's important in terms of the auto industry and the working class in this country and all that, how in the world can we destroy Detroit 
like it is being destroyed. And it is consciously being destroyed. It's not, you know, it's not like it, this is an accident. You know, and, and we can go into that a lot about the role that the auto workers has played in the development of this country, both, both economically and socially and politically. But I don't have time for that right now. But, but because it was the epicenter of the struggle and the destruction that is going on, and it represents all of the, you know, the, the, the view of where capitalism is actually going is right there. Then we decided that Detroit should be that next place. And, you know, and so we really put in a lot of thought to all these processes. And the lesson that I think is important for all of you is that, you know, if you're going to do anything, the first thing you have to figure out is what your long-term goal. Our long-term goals was building a social movement. And then place everything within that context. You know, what is, why should you do this? How is it going to affect that bigger process? And not just how do you make a good event take place. Thank you. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Daryl Jordan, and I learned a quick lesson uh, sitting here listening to uh, Cindy and Jerome with us that uh, I prepared a whole lot more than I'm going to get to talk about. Um, <laughs> I'm going to try to share with you some, um, some thoughts that I have that I think might be helpful in terms of uh, over the weekend ha continuing the discussion about how can we work with each other, uh, bringing our skills and our resources and other things to the table to make movement happen. And uh, I'm going to come from the uh, area of talking about the real challenge of learning how we work together. Because sometimes we make some assumptions that we know how to work with each other and we know about each other. <laughs> And some of us, the more experience we have organizing or the more time we spend in school, we think that we understand a whole lot of things that we really don't understand. Uh, and that's dealing with people. Uh, humans are an interesting uh, thing to learn how to deal with. And within that context, I'm going to talk about the youth, the World Social Forum and an international gathering that they're calling to deal with the issue of Palestine. And I'm going to start off by saying that telling you right now, I'm not an expert on Palestine, and clearly I'm not Palestinian, even though I see some brothers and sisters over there that look just like me. So some of you should be challenged to go. I've seen some people over there in Palestine who are Palestinian that look like a lot of you all sit there. Uh, but, uh, but one of the major challenges has been that when you call for a social forum and you tell everybody to bring their issues with them, everybody shows up and they bring their issues with them, and they bring their problems with them, they bring the good stuff with them, and then you have a room full of a whole lot of stuff that you've got to figure out how to na navigate that stuff and make it happen. Well, Palestine is a particularly hard issue to deal with, because sometimes we come to the table and we haven't really done the analysis that we already understand is out there. If you begin to understand that Palestine is a, is, is a, is a country uh, seeking, uh, a people seeking to get their country back. And the problem with Palestine and Israel is that the U.S., their history is the same as the U.S., and we don't want to talk about it, do we? I know we're in a university. I hope I don't get nobody uh, kicked off the campus or anything, because we rarely talk about the U.S. as a separate colony. But that's exactly what it is. So uh, Europeans showed up here and decided that they wanted this country. They had something better to do with it than the folks who were already living here. And so they decided to take this country on, and this became the United States. And now we carry our arrogant butts all over, the, all over the world and tell people how great we are. Even those of us who want to, want to uh, say that we're revolutionary, we carry the same U.S. bullshit with us when we go places. And people know it and they see it. But, uh, <coughs> but Palestine is a particularly interesting uh, problem because sometimes when we, have, when we have issues that are hard to navigate, we don't really understand how to negotiate around them. And it's not unlike apartheid in South Africa, or uh, racism in, in, in the South, uh, when, when people were trying to come together to uh, work around it. A lot of people wanted to come and help black folks in the South, but they didn't necessarily understand the culture, and they didn't understand the terrain, and they didn't understand these uh, hundreds of years' worth of policies and how we get along and how we didn't do some things in order to get along. And so now we talk about Palestine. <coughs> the, World, the World Social Forum has figured out that in most of the international and national gatherings, there has not been a real place where people could sit down and have a heartfelt discussion about Palestine and 
how we move forward to make this situation right. There's been the World Conference Against Racism, and for those of you who wasn't around to understand what happened there, uh, the U.S. decided that it was time to pull its people out at the point that folks wanted to say that Zionism was very similar. Zionism is racism. Uh, and so we pulled the people out. So there, there went the U.S. and a lot of NGOs and other folks uh, had a uh, carpet pulled from under them. And then there's been the other world social forum events around the world and the U.S. social forum, and they have been hard to have that discussion because all of us come to the table and we don't necessarily know a whole lot about Palestinians or the situation of Palestine. But we, we want to do what we, what we think is right, and so we come there and we put a good, a good heartfelt effort toward trying to make things happen. And sometimes mistakes happen. And the mistakes happen sometimes because we're ignorant of, of how we deal with each other and ignorant of some of the issues. Sometimes it comes because we're ignorant of understanding how the enemy and I use that word enemy intentionally, how the enemy operates. <coughs> and that when you began to talk about a nation like Israel that, that does the U.S.'s bidding and their own in that particular part of the world, and then to talk about a nation that receives $3 billion of U.S. money, that's just the direct aid. And then they get another $3 billion of indirect aid. And all this money is basically military and is used for military stuff and occupation to help keep things in place. And if we don't really understand how all that comes together and what the repercussions are in the U.S. and how their folks over here with our arrogant selves <coughs> and think we're going to change something, then we, we're sort of misformed and we, and we don't move like we should because we don't truly understand. Then the other thing is 911 happened. God forbid, you know, that was like the end of anything that happened at the world. Uh, conference against racism. Uh, hardly anybody. Did anybody go to do the World Conference Against Racism? No? Just a couple of people? Well, most people will tell you that for everything that happened over there that people got excited about, after 911 happened, there wasn't not a discussion about the issues or the movement kind of coming together that people had talked about in the international gap. And so when you began to think about that, then you began to understand that the world social forum had a whole lot of expectations that people bore with them because they understood that W. Carr didn't, didn't produce what people had hoped it would. Well, this November 28th to December 1st, let me get the dates in before I get sidetracked and I'll tell you. People will be meeting in Brazil and Porto Alegre to talk about uh, the issue of Palestine and how we can come together, the important part is come together and begin to do something to change that situation. Uh, it's important to understand that, uh, I don't know how many, the, first, the meeting that, that decided to partition Palestine also happened in Porto Alegre, uh, Brazil. And about the same time period, about this time of year, you know, it must have been something about those UN folks that they wanted to get some uh, hot weather before it got cold too. So they ran down to Brazil to have this meeting, and that's where the petition of, uh, of uh, Palestine happened. And so we're going to get the uh, World Social Forum has decided that they're going to pull an international global gathering of people to put our heads together to figure out what it is that we need to be doing wherever we are to make a change in this situation. Owning up to the fact that we have some serious competition on the other side. Uh, U.S. colonialism and support for Israel and support for a whole lot of other countries that are, should, are doing things that they shouldn't be doing, like occupying other folks. Um, as misusing the resources and whatever. And why should you be interested in Palestine? Why should any of us be interested in Palestine? Um, well, three million dollars today probably doesn't sound like that big a thing, especially if you looked at the uh, presidential debates, because they were throwing around trillions and around like this stuff was four four dollars and fifty cents. But three billion dollars is a lot of money. And when you add the other indirect three million, three billion. You got six billion dollars, and we live in a country where schools can't buy books, women can't feed their children, uh, men can't find jobs, women can't find jobs either. Uh, we got a situation where prison, we have the largest prison population in the world, uh, and it costs more to go to Trenton State than uh, Princeton. Uh, if you don't know, Trenton State is not a community college. Trenton State is the state penitentiary in New Jersey. Yeah, we got some real concerns. And that the economy isn't going to get any better. It's going to get much worse. And one of the, uh, I think, one of the opportune times that the social forum is taking right now is that when times get 
is how people get conservative, even organizations that think they are real progressive end up having to get conservative. Because when people realize that, that, that they don't have the funds and they don't have the resources and the kinds of things that they need to have a good life, they start trying to cut back on stuff and figure out how can we just hold out to something change. Well, we can't hold out to something change. We got to do something about this situation and we got to start doing something about it now. And so I should say, in, in the effort to try to have these discussions, all kinds of things happen. And people come to situations with different mindsets. And so when, when you, if we were coming here to talk about the situation of black folks and all of a sudden we couldn't talk about black folks in this room, you could imagine I'd be really upset. Maybe another couple of you all would be upset. Well, that's sort of what happens every time Palestinians open their eyes and their hearts, they're hoping that they actually get a good hearing so the folks understand what's going on. And oftentimes, there, there's mistakes made uh, and whatever. And so we have to understand that, that these things happen. And rather than, than fighting each other and backbiting and doing a lot of stuff, then that's the call for us to get deeper in terms of our understanding about each other. When I went to Palestine, you know what I found out? That Palestine was a lot like being in the U.S. Even though I was living in Philadelphia, and I live in Detroit too, and I went to Palestine, I found it was just like being home. Uh, we got stopped everywhere we went. <laughs> uh, uh, the police, every time you walked in a place, you were the center of attention. Uh, everybody you talked to had a sister, brother, uncle, son, somebody in jail. Uh, nobody really had uh, enough of what they really wanted to eat. They might be eating something. And then uh, the folks who, who, like me, who think that we're revolutionaries, showed up there asking people, well, why don't y'all boycott Israeli war? And see, that's what I call sometimes we don't understand what time it is, are the issues. And so we found out that the reasons for the walls, the reasons for why the West Bank is over there, <coughs> separated from Gaza and stuff, it means that you can control what goes in and what comes out. So you can boycott Israeli water, yeah, and be thirsty as hell, because that's all the water you see in Rami if you happen to live on the West Bank. I mean, you know, uh, there, might, there might be a few folks doing, create, uh, making Palestinian water. I don't even, I said that wrong. I know we don't make water, but we bottle water. Uh, but just bottling that water and figuring out how to distribute it to the people who want to drink Palestinian water, that's an impossibility. I know sometimes for us when we got over there, that was a mind boggling thing, you know? You can't even determine what kind of water you want to drink. See, that's that kind of stuff we get here in the U.S. that we think we get to have anything we want to. Because even if we can't afford it, you know, we can go sign our name on the little line and they'll give it to us because we don't understand it. That's the way you keep people oppressed. Keep giving them shit they can't afford and keep giving them stuff that they don't need. And next thing you know, they can't afford to survive because they boggle down with all this other bullshit. Um, and, uh, I guess the one thing that I want to say is that for scholar activists and for organizers like us, we need to be working with each other because there's research, there's understanding people at the depth that some of us organizers don't have the, the time to do. And so somebody ought to be doing the work to understand what, what, what has been the sociological history of what it's like to be Palestinian and find out that your grandmother and, and your parents I lived in Palestine, but at the point that your grandfather was was 35 and had two kids, that somebody came into the village and took the houses and they had to leave. I mean, we don't really know, well, some of us know a little bit about that, because some of that stuff happened in the South, but we're not good at telling each other stories, so we don't know, because there are lots of stories about where black folks thought they were doing all right in the South, and all of a sudden, folks came and said, you got 24 hours to get your ass out of here. And they thought about it, they said, can we fight back? And they said, well, we got two shotguns and a pistol. And they got a whole goddamn police force. And then they said, well, what do we do? And somebody said, get a car, borrow a car, or let's hit the bus. We're going north. That's how a lot of families got to the north. I mean, you know. But Palestinians, they're all over the world. And then in the U.S., they're isolated communities. I mean, they're targeted. And so are some of us. But there's an intentional target on Palestinians, especially after 911. Uh, you remember uh, Oklahoma? We, we forget about Oklahoma and the bombing in Oklahoma, because those was the good old days. I mean, you know, uh, we'd be in Pittsburgh, shoot, another four and a half hours, and you could be up there in Decker with those good old boys that blew up Oklahoma. But there's no war against rednecks. 
Oh, hell no. I hope I didn't touch no, no black men here. But there's no war against rednecks. You know, they can go around and do any goddamn thing that they want to do, just like they always did. But there is a war against Arabs and Muslims in this country because we've decided that they blew up their uh, World Trade Center. And so there's a war against every Arab and Muslim. You know, even the Nation of Islam. And them brothers was over here, um, you know, before 911. You know, they, they were always looked at suspiciously. But after 911, they said, well, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe we, they should look more closely at them too. And so if you happen to be Muslim, if that's your religion, then you're a suspect in this country. And so that means that they are separated a lot from the general population, the general thinking, even in schools. I don't know if some of you teach high school or middle school or whatever. But you find those kids are in a, in a bad situation because they don't know who to trust. I mean, they can only trust each other because they catch discrimination from everywhere. I mean, you know, even black folks, I mean, you know, and Africans who come to this country. Now, I know, I'm going to tell the truth as I see. When Africans come to this country, many times they tell Africans the last place you want to be is in the African American community. It ain't going to get you no brownie points, it ain't going to help you out. And in that same way, I think that there's a mentality that it, even in the schools, kids are smarter than we think they are. They understand that you don't get no brownie points by aligning yourself and becoming friends uh, with, with folks who are considered undesirables, like Muslims and Arabs. And so it's a real thing. And so there have been some problems in meetings trying to come to that. And so in Puerto Alegre, Brazil, for those of you who have the wherewithal to organize and get some money to come and be a part of that meeting, and for those of you who might be lucky enough to have a father or a mom that got enough money sitting in the bank that they're not going to use this year uh, to get you a ticket, this is going to be the place to be. And this is going to be the place to be because this is going to give us hopefully that one opportunity where we can sit down and put our heads together in a real way and talk about real things that we can do when we get back. Not the ideological shit. Uh, but the, you know that, I, I meant, you, you know how we get sometimes and we get all dreamy about stuff. Uh, but this is a real time to talk about what we do, where we do it, and how can we put those resources and that energy together to make something happen together. And I think that that's one of the biggest challenges of the U.S. social forum that we've been dealing with. And hopefully this weekend when we have some further discussions or whatever, that we'll leave here having a better understanding of how we begin to learn from each other and how we build coalitions based on a real honest relationship building, where we're not pretending and faking and doing all that other kind of stuff. And I, I didn't talk about some of the specifics of some of the issues around Palestine, because I learned listening if Jerome just got to point one, uh, I wasn't going to even finish that discussion. You know, and, uh, and I'm probably as long-winded as Jerome. And so, uh, so having said that, you can feel free to ask me any questions that you like, and uh, it's probably going to be uh, easier to talk at your reception. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Rose Brewer, and I'm going to pick up on some of the things that have been articulated <coughs> by the previous speakers around uh, the World Social Forum, the uh, U.S. Social Forum, and uh, the World uh, Social Forum uh, Palestine, which is up and, and Daryl just said a, a few things about. Um, I have been a part of uh, the organizing committee um, of the World Social Forum, uh, Free Palestine, and uh, that's not accidental. Uh, it, in fact, is very much connected uh, to my uh, earlier commitment and work with um, the U.S. Social Forums, uh, the Atlanta Forum and uh, the Detroit Forum, and having attended actually several world social forums, uh, the last one being in uh, Bikar, uh, Senegal, um, part of uh, grassroots global justice delegation, as well as a, 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 a working group to end poverty, uh, <coughs> also a group of uh, delegates there, so kind of a joint delegate uh, situation in, in my case. But in the context of uh, some of the things that have been said about the U.S. Social Forum, one of the commitments that was made by the National Planning uh, Committee, uh, the NPC, uh, was uh, a commitment to uh, organize as well as send uh, a group of delegates to uh, the uh, 
World Social Forum in uh, Palestine, uh, to Free Palestine in uh, Port Alegre or Brazil coming up in November. Uh, so there was support coming out of uh, the organizing committee uh, that had the support of the United States Social Forum. So there is a lot of entanglement uh, between uh, the work that's going on here and the work that's going on globally. You've got a, a bit of a history of how uh, there was a lot of intentionality, a lot of thinking through at which moment there would be a United States Social Forum. It wasn't uh, an accidental thing. It wasn't. Uh, it took a long time for it to happen. So that's a little bit of the context. So that's one piece I want to keep in mind, that entanglement of the U.S. Uh, social forum, of the World Social Forum, with this regional forum that will happen in uh, Brazil, focused in on uh, Palestine at a very momentous moment. Uh, as Daryl mentioned, uh, the partition happened in Brazil uh, 65 years ago. Uh, there have been a number of meetings over the past several months by the delegation and uh, also a, a joint statement that I want to share a little bit with you. Uh, some of these documents are available and I hope you all will be reading them and accessing them over the, the next few days. Um, but the various organizations that have worked in uh, the organizing process have worked very intensely in an educational mode, and I think that's something we want to keep in mind, and it uh, connects to a point that Daryl made, that we know so little about the struggle in this country. We know so little about that history, and the idea of engaging in joint struggle, people in struggle here connected to those in struggle globally, is a key piece of the momentum of sending us forward. So in this case for joint struggle, is a document. I'm going to just excerpt just a little bit from it because it has uh, contemporary relevance, especially when it comes to the African American community. Um, in 1970, uh, there was an appeal by black Americans against United States support of the Zionist government of Israel. And this is excerpted from a New York Times advertisement posted November 1st, 1970. And it states, We uh, the black American signatories of this advertisement are in complete solidarity with our Palestinian brothers and sisters who, like us, are struggling for self-determination and an end to racist oppression. We stand with the Palestinian people in their efforts to preserve their revolution and oppose its attempted destruction by American imperialism aided by Zionists and Arab reactionaries. We state that we are not anti-Jewish, we are anti-Zionist and against the Zionist state of Israel, the outpost of American imperialism in the Middle East. Zionism is a reactionary racist ideology that justifies the expulsion of the Palestinian people from their homes and lands and attempts to enlist the Jewish masses of Israel and elsewhere in the service of imperialism to hold back the Middle East revolution. We demand that all military aid or assistance of any kind to Israel must stop. Imperialism and Zionism must and will get out of the Middle East. We call for African-American solidarity with the Palestinian people's struggle for national liberation and to regain all of their stolen land. And, and to read that again uh, in the context of this delegation that is organizing uh, to go to Puerto Alegre, Brazil, it is an amazing piece because it reminds us that in the period since, how much the disconnect with that history has occurred uh, within uh, the African American community as well as in radical struggle more generally. There once was a time when there were clearer connections, when there was a deeper solidarity, and there are reasons why uh, that connection uh, has been broken. And part of the educational process that has been going on is to remind us that there is this history with a lot of joint interests uh, that I want to say a little bit about. But I wanted to state that claim about heritage and history that not only uh, younger people don't know, but many uh, of uh, the older progressives and, if you will, radicals have forgotten through willful amnesia or were not connected to it to begin with. So this idea of joint struggle is the organizing principle for the U.S. delegation. And you know, you have to ask the question, what in fact does that mean under current conditions? It was very clear in 1970 
there was a political motion that some of you in this room are very much aware of, uh, that this country was in turmoil, that there really was uh, an attempt to create a revolutionary struggle, and especially a black revolution that demanded self-determination. A uh, very different political moment with uh, the so-called first black uh, president of the United States. And you can see uh, where we were and where we've come. And it is really a call, I believe, uh, for a reconnection to that black radical tradition. And when we think about uh, this idea of uh, joint struggle, we are, in fact, saying that we are in this together. Uh, now, we may not understand how we're in this together, but there are ways in which we are. And part of our organizing has been to make those connections, to make it very clear about how all of us are in this together. Uh, Daryl mentioned a few of uh, those uh, connections, and they are deeply rooted in a certain set of political facts that uh, some of you are well aware of, uh, uh, the least of them being the fact that, uh, that uh, much money goes into uh, the Israeli state. But there are a lot of other aspects of that geopolitical reality that we should be uh, very much concerned about. If there is an open uh, prison industrial complex, if you will, in the occupied territories of Palestine, there are over two million black and brown people in this country who are incarcerated. Uh, also, going back to some of the points that Daryl made, uh, do we know that there is joint uh, training among police forces in this country uh, by the Israeli police and security forces. And uh, as political brutality and police brutality occur in this country, it mimics uh, the procedures and processes that have been passed on uh, to the police forces in this country. The fact that so much money that could go to the needs and uh, the demands of uh, folk who are losing schools, uh, the needs and demands of, uh, of children who don't have uh, sufficient books and other resources uh, tells us how much it is a connection that we need to make. So the black freedom struggle, and that's the point of departure uh, that I make uh, most of my comparisons, uh, has always been uh, deeper and wider than a U.S. domestic uh, struggle. But we've often uh, forgotten that. Um, it has been internationalist in scale, and we have to reconnect uh, to that heritage and to that memory that uh, not only uh, is this a movement that is global, but it has to be a, a movement that is uh, local. And let me say just a few other uh, things about uh, that uh, connection. Um, the uh, Malcolm X Grassroots Movement, which is one of the organizations supporting uh, this uh, organizing uh, entity uh, to uh, Palestine has recently released a report that says every 40 hours uh, a black woman, man, or child is killed by the police, security forces, or some kind of agent of the state in the United States. I've already mentioned that a lot of this training has come uh, through the U.S.-Israeli connections. That there is a certain uh, intentionality in uh, the process uh, that uh, the kind of apartheid that characterized uh, South Africa uh, also uh, characterizes what we're facing today in terms of the intense surveillance in many of these communities. I'm now living in Chicago where uh, the gun trade has uh, penetrated uh, the west and south side to such an extent uh, that uh, there have been over 300 young people who have been murdered. Uh, and those children don't produce the guns. They don't uh, manufacture the guns, but those guns are put in those communities. And the arm trade that is represented in this geopolitical context that uh, I just described is one that uh, we should be very, very aware of. Uh, so this idea of uh, making joint struggle, uh, building relationships, the, the price and uh, the context that we're dealing with is high. And let me just say um, a few other things that um, might bring this uh, uh, closer to home. Um, at the center, I think, of the amnesia and the lack of familiarity with an earlier history is a very intentional erasure 
uh, from history, from uh, the kind of uh, understanding that scholars engage in. Uh, we don't know this history. Uh, one of the things that uh, I've done with other activists in the Twin Cities is to uh, begin to do some fundraising. And in fact, last week, we had a, a fundraiser to help support the delegation that's going uh, to Palestine. And we had community members, many of them who consider themselves activists. And as we began to talk about uh, this history and what it means to work in an integrated way, uh, where our struggle is in fact intimately connected to the Palestinian struggle, uh, many people just very honestly said, I don't know that history. Uh, I struggle here in this country, but I've never thought about the connections. And that, I think, is one of the struggles that uh, we're confronting as we try to build uh, an integrated, intersective uh, set of relationships. Uh, so political, uh, popular, and other kind of education is a big demand. And as educators, as teachers, as scholars, and activists, it is incumbent on us to make sure that our curriculum is integrated in a way that these struggles are understood and known. Um, let me just uh, close by a couple of other observations. Uh, we had a telephone call, I guess it was two nights ago, and uh, it was a tremendous call because uh, uh, there was a Palestinian uh, who was on the call. Um, there was someone from the IC who is now organizing uh, uh, in uh, Puerto Alegre, Brazil. And uh, many of us who are part of the delegation were very excited to hear these voices. And uh, the Palestinian point was that the United States is a very important place to bring consciousness to, uh, to have a delegation to Puerto Rico because of the role it plays in the world, uh, from imperialism to neocolonialism to uh, the joint political uh, struggles that we've uh, understood uh, occurring between uh, Israel and uh, the support uh, given by the United States. So his point was, it is most important uh, that a delegation from this country actually uh, goes to Puerto Libra, uh, learns with, hears from, connects with uh, the Palestinian uh, delegation, and as well as delegates from all over the world. There are 30 countries that are organizing around this. And uh, it is a, a very powerful organizational motion. Uh, the IC uh, uh, representative indicated that if you can't come to uh, Puerto Libra, uh, the methodologies they're using will make uh, the sessions broadly available uh, from Skype, which we're all familiar with, but with new technologies uh, that will allow folk who are here to actually join into some of the conversations that will be happening there. So it was a, a really an exciting kind of a conversation. Let me just wrap up by saying, um, you know, this is a big task. Um, and I think the power of the United States Social Forum is that it opened up a space for folk who have either been in long time struggle or new to the movement to be in the same room together. It opened up a possibility for a certain kind of joint struggle. And it opened up our eyes to an internationalism that's buried in our history, but has been resurrected because we connected the work of the United States Social Forum to the World Social Forum. And, and movement building work is never easy. Um, you know, uh, the kind of collective and mutual responsibility that we have to have with one another is the essence of joint struggle. Um, it has never been all that simple. It never will. But I think this is an exciting moment with a lot of uh, possibilities, challenges, but we must be up uh, to the task. Thank you very much. I've really been so uh, inspired by um, what people have said so far. Jackie, thank you very much for, for organizing this. Um, my name is Valentin Bogadam. Um, and uh, I'm uh, currently at Northeastern University. I arrived there in January. Um, and um, I, uh, I prepared something for, for this panel, but um, after hearing everyone, um, I thought that I would uh, do something a little different. 
coalition building and conflict. Um, I, uh, I came of age during the Iranian Revolution. I was part of the Iranian Revolution. Um, and, um, and I was also a member um, of the uh, Iranian Students Association, which was a part of the Confederation of Iranian Students. Um, and uh, actually, during the revolution, I was uh, in Washington, D.C., and that's where I met Walda and uh, Walden Bello and others because I was international secretary in charge of meeting all the, uh, the representatives of all the other um, uh, movements and, uh, and struggles. So uh, El Salvador, Nicaragua, um, the All African People's Revolutionary Party, um, the Chileans, the Palestinians, Democratic Front, Popular Front, Baca, you name it, um, uh, was there. Um, the, uh, the Iranian uh, student organization at the time, the, uh, uh, and especially the Confederation of Iranian Students, uh, was extraordinarily well organized. It was uh, very centralized, it was hierarchical, it was very, very disciplined, and it was extraordinarily effective. So um, there are several lessons um, uh, from my experience uh, in the Iranian Revolution, and especially in this student movement, um, and I've, um, uh, I've, I've both studied different revolutions and social movements and also been part of them and been very um, uh, supportive of, of quite a number of them. But I'm really struck by the big difference between the kind of organizing that was done during the Iranian Revolution, and especially in the form of the Confederation of Iranian Students, and then in 2009 with the Green Movement, the Green Protest uh, in Iran as well as with Occupy Wall Street. So today there seems to be um, um, uh, more popularity with this idea of um, non-hierarchical, sort of flat, horizontal, et cetera, type of, of organizing. Um, and there is something to be said for that type of super democratic um, process, um, but, um, but there's also something else to be said about it, and the question is how effective can it really be? Um, so perhaps it is an empirical question, perhaps we have to wait and see, but this is the lesson that I learned from the Iranian Revolution, in particular one of the lessons, um, and from my experience in the Confederation of, of Iranian Students. Um, another um, lesson of the Iranian Revolution, apart from the fact that organization, coordination, centralization, and hierarchy really do matter, um, um, is that um, is that a very broad-based um, uh, coalition, a very broad-based uh, opposition movement, can also be very, very effective um, in targeting um, you know, an enemy um, and, and bringing, bringing it down. Um, and of course, many revolutions have been organized that way. And, you know, I've, I've written papers on the Iranian revolution, and I've talked about one revolution or two in that first phase, was what, what myself and several others, others have called the populist revolution. And we've had other populist revolutions in, in uh, developing in third world countries too. But the problem with that kind of very, very broad based um, uh, sort of coalition um, is that certain groups can be totally overshadowed by other groups that are much better organized, much better resourced, um, and uh, much better uh, mobilized and have a longer history and uh, you know, other kinds of advantages. And that's what happened to the left in the Iranian Revolution. Um, now, then there is another lesson, and that is what happened after the revolution, where uh, the left groups, and I was part of, of course, the communist left, um, we engaged in um, sort of ideological purity and sectarianism, and we declined to form another kind of coalition and uh, broad-based um, uh, sort of alliance of progressive groups. And that was our tragic historic mistake. So, um, and I've written about that too in, in, uh, in, in an article years ago in the Left Review. Um, so that's another, um, uh, another lesson about ideological purity and, and sectarianism. And the fourth lesson of the Iranian Revolution has to do with patriarchy and putting women's rights and feminism on the back burner. Um, the, um, the left uh, tragically also lost um, a pretty big constituency. Um, and after the, um, um, after the party, as it were, um, after um, the Islamists, who were the ones who came out on top um, in the revolutionary process, 
um, after they eliminated, often physically, um, their erstwhile um, coalition partners in the anti-Shah revolution through um, arrest, torture, execution, and forced exile. Um, after, after that happened, there was a long period of um, self-criticism, self-reflection and self-criticism on the part of, um, of, the, of, of the left. Um, Jerome said that evaluation is good, and we did a lot of that kind of evaluation and self-criticism for quite a number of years. And in fact, it went on to such an extent that many of my former comrades became liberals. Um, <laughs> Which do not include 
employers, and especially in leadership positions. Um, and uh, so, hey, you have a situation in which um, on March 8th, uh, 2011, um, just uh, you know, a couple of weeks after the victory in, um, uh, in, in Egypt, um, a group of women go out onto Tahrir Square, which supposedly had become the People's Square, but evidently the people are, do not include feminists and women's rights activists. And then they were attacked by you know, these, uh, these guys who feel that you know, women should not actually be out asserting, uh, uh, you know, advocating for their own rights. Um, in Libya, um, almost immediately after um, you know, Ghazanti uh, uh, was so brutally murdered, um, uh, the, the new transitional leader comes out and declares that all the laws of the land would have to conform to the Sharia, and oh, by the way, we're going to be re returning uh, polygamy. And so one uh, Libyan woman said, is this what we fought for, so that Libyan men can have four wives? So these are, uh, this is a really, really critical and important issue, the question of the patriarchal attitudes and practices. Today in Tunisia, for example, just was it last month or, or a couple of months ago, we, as part of this constitution writing, um, the, uh, the Islamist party wanted to remove the reference to equality in the constitution and substitute the word complementarity. Mm -hmm. And that became a big issue there as well. So um, that's, uh, that's, that's another one. Um, the question then becomes, how do we have a democratization, a successful transition to democracy in the Middle East and North Africa, which is women friendly, which is friendly to uh, women's rights and which incorporates women's rights right at the core of the polity, of the economy, and of uh, the culture. And that's something that I'm writing, uh, writing about, and that's also why I want to go to Tunisia, and I'm in constant dialogue with my friends in, in North Africa, and uh, uh, including in Tunisia. But I know I have to wrap up, but I want to say one last thing about um, the Middle East and North Africa region because I was so inspired by um, uh, the, uh, the preceding speakers who talked about, and you know, Rose, you also mentioned that in 1970 there was this newspaper article that said that you know, Zionism and imperialism has to go up from the Middle East. Um, imperialism is not leaving it is being reinforced and it is asserting itself through these constant forms of intervention in the region. Whether it be Iraq in 2003, Libya last year, Syria this year, um, and through the surrogates like Turkey, Qatar, and Saudi Arabia. As long as um, Americans, especially progressive Americans, do not raise their voices against, not only against the trillions, the billions that go to Israel, and I totally agree with you on that, um, but also all of the arms uh, shipments that go everywhere else in the Middle East, and the support, both military and diplomatic, as well as moral, that goes to um, 